Bom dia, bem-vindo a todos aqui ao nosso primeiro seminário sobre arte de descolonização. Eu sou o Adriano Pedrosa, diretor artístico aqui do MASP, e eu gostaria de começar fazendo alguns agradecimentos. Primeiramente, a nossa parceira e coorganizadora desse seminário, a After All, que é um centro de pesquisa e publicação da University of the Arts de Londres, a Universidade de Arte de Londres, dedicado à arte contemporânea e suas histórias. Esse é o primeiro evento de um projeto de longo prazo em torno de arte e descolonização, entre o MASP e a After All, e estão previstos um segundo seminário internacional como este no ano que vem, e mais tarde uma publicação, uma antologia de textos sobre o tema, no mesmo formato, num formato similar às antologias que nós temos feito desde o ano passado com histórias da sexualidade, a antologia né, daquele ano, e esse ano também da antologia uh, de histórias afroatlânticas. Um reconhecimento especial é devido ao British Council e à British Academy de Londres, do Reino Unido, que nos forneceram fundos para a realização do projeto e da colaboração com a After All, e também aos nossos parceiros estratégicos, como sempre, o Itaú e a Vivo, que fornecem um patrocínio fundamental para as atividades do museu em todos os níveis, inclusive nos núcleos de mediação e de programas públicos, e também no núcleo editorial, que estão, de alguma forma, ou, enfim, muito envolvidos nesse projeto com a After All em torno da arte da descolonização. Agradeço ainda aos organizadores desse seminário, o André Mesquita, que é o coordenador da mediação de programas públicos do MASP, a Carolyn Woodley e o Mark Lewis, da After All, com a colaboração para esse seminário de Ana Bilbao e Aiza Hernandes Velasquez. Agradeço também a todos os convidados que, né, que vieram e aceitaram o nosso convite aqui para vir a São Paulo para esse seminário, também como os mediadores das mesas e toda a equipe do museu que trabalhou nesse projeto. Nós temos falado e pensado muito sobre arte e descolonização aqui no museu, desde que chegamos ao MASP, né? eu estou aqui já completando quatro anos nesse mês, uh, e nesse tempo nós fizemos uma renovação praticamente completa da equipe do museu e da equipe curatorial. Né? Não é fácil, e não pretendo nesse momento, definir com precisão a noção de descolonização, sobretudo em relação à arte. Né? Mas quando o MASP, que sempre foi conhecido como um museu de arte europeia, uma referência nesse sentido, sempre se definiu como o mais importante acervo europeu no Hemisfério Sul, quando nós reescrevemos a missão do museu no ano passado, nós definimos o museu como uma instituição diversa, inclusiva e plural, algo que, de algum modo, já apontava para desafiar hierarquias, territórios e tipologias da coleção do acervo. Nosso interesse na chamada arte popular, na chamada arte dos uh, artistas autodidatas, nas produções uh, indígenas, nas produções afroatlânticas, falam também desse interesse, do mesmo modo que essas no, a nossa série de diferentes exposições em torno de, de muitas histórias ao longo dos anos. Né? Ano passado, nós trabalhamos em torno das histórias da sexualidade, esse ano estamos trabalhando com as histórias afroatlânticas, inclusive a exposição coletiva está aí aberta, domingo é o último dia, né? ela se encerra, então, para quem ainda não viu, convido é, a, a visitar a exposição. Estão previstas também histórias feministas no ano que vem, histórias indígenas em 2021. Né? A questão da descolonização no campo da arte, do museu e suas histórias, nos parece particularmente importante, porque é justamente na arte e no museu que os nexos ou relações coloniais de poder parecem sobreviver e se impor. Né? através justamente de territorializações, de hierarquias, de estabelecimentos e distinções entre tipologias, departamentos. Né? Isso, de fato, nós vemos essa, como, como todas essas distinções, que muitas vezes 
traduzem também hierarquia, sobrevivem em muitos museus do mundo inteiro. Né? Pode-se dizer que a história da arte, né, com a história da arte tradicional, com suas raízes, estruturas e modelos profundamente europeus, ainda é um dos aparatos mais poderosos e duradouros do imperialismo. Né? Estamos sempre falando e pensando em torno de arte e descolonização aqui na equipe curatorial do museu, o que certamente vai se refletir no programa da instituição, mas quem subir hoje ao segundo andar do acervo em transformação, né, a nossa exposição de longa duração do acervo, verá ainda um display dominado por, ar, por arte europeia e muitas obras de homens brancos europeus. Mas, ao final do display, lá temos, é algo que nós te, temos tentado trabalhar né, e desafiar aí nos últimos quatro anos, ao final do display temos lá, por exemplo, um cartaz do, das Guerrilla Girls, né, esse grupo de artistas fe, feministas uh, norte-americanas, né, que ano passado realizou uh, uma exposição no museu, e o cartaz justamente aponta para isso, é uma lembrança, né, pra, pra uma, uma lembrança que está sempre lá colocada né, como, como última sentença dessa narrativa da, do display. Né. Do women need to be naked to get into the Museu de Arte de São Paulo? Only 6% of the artists on the display are women, but 60% of the nudes are female. Né. As mulheres precisam estar nuas para entrar no MASP, apenas 6% das artistas em exposição no acervo são mulheres, embora 60% dos nus são femininos. Né? Esses dados são do ano passado, mais ou menos há um ano atrás. Hoje estão um pouco melhores, em vez de 6%, estamos com 12%. Mas, enfim, ainda há muito trabalho a ser feito. Por outro, la por outro lado, nossos curadores, diretores, conselheiros do museu, são todos brancos, e a grande maioria homens brasileiros, né? mas hoje temos também colaboradoras negras que trabalham em exposições, organizando exposições e programas uh, de exposições aqui no museu. Né? A verdade é que sempre pode-se descolonizar mais, e esse seminário é a oportunidade para todos nós refletirmos sobre o assunto e tentar imaginar novos caminhos, percursos e possibilidades. Muito obrigado. Convido agora o Mark. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Lewis, and I'm the director and co-founder with Charles Esche of After All, a research and publishing project based at the University of the Arts in London. Today, I join with my colleagues here at MASP in welcoming you to the first of many collaborative projects and events that After All and MASP will be doing over the coming years. For us at After All, this collaboration is a significant development in our own project, and mostly, most importantly, it is our first partnership in the South. The collaboration with MASP began last year when the British Council invited After All to participate in a cultural exchange with an institution in Brazil. We were invited to choose a city and a specific institution in that city. I chose Sao Paulo, Well, simply because I love Sao Paulo. I chose MASP because of its history of engagement with art and ideas, and of course they had to choose us too. And because of its signature building by Lino Bobardi with its own radical propositions, and because of its central engagement with the 20th century, 20th century idea of building a city of and for the future. Today's conference, of course, is part of the rethinking of that important idea, and for which Sao Paulo is a central figure, I believe. To make the city of the future relevant for the 21st century, to ensure, for instance, especially in these terrible and horrific even pop so-called populist times, that inclusivity and the acknowledgement of histories and the history of conflicts and revisions be more than just intellectual ideas, that they instead be part of a radical rethink of what it means to be a city of the future, now defined by all of its cultures and all of its heretofore elisions and erasures. On a more personal note, I chose Mass because it contains amongst this beautiful collection of classical European art, one of my favorite paintings, Chardin's Boy with a Spinning Top. This painting has been with me throughout my career as an artist. It has been an invaluable guide on how to be modern. It is a constant reminder to me of the modern idea 
that a work of art can depict wonder in the smallest details of everyday life. But it has also exquisitely, enchantingly, shown me that a work of art can be a haiku of wonder itself. So my very special thanks to Eli Varakis and the British Council for affording me the opportunity to now be able to spend many extra hours in front of this painting. The collaboration with MASP and Sao Paulo has become a passion for all of us at After All. I want to thank everyone here for making it possible and for new friends too. Adriana Pedrosa for his enthusiasm and ideas. Andre Mosquito, who I've worked very closely with, along with Adriano and Carolina Rossetti in designing the program and raising the money. And of course, the entire intellectual team here at MASP. To the British Academy for their two year generous support of our collaboration. To Caroline Woodley, Yaisa Her Hernandez Velasquez, and Anna Bilbao from After All for assisting with the development of this project. And of course, the British Council, and particularly Ellie Varakis for initiating everything. Finally, thank you to all of our speakers for agreeing to participate. But most importantly, thank you for all, to all of you for joining us here today and tomorrow. Thank you. Bom dia a todos. Meu nome é Tomás Toledo, trabalho aqui no museu e vou mediar essa nossa primeira mesa do dia. Gostaria de lembrá-los que as perguntas devem ser feitas por escrito e entregues às pessoas do museu, os representantes do museu que vão estar em torno da plateia. É, essas perguntas também podem ser feitas durante as falas e é, ao final das três primeiras falas dessa mesa eu vou compilar as perguntas e apresentar aos palestrantes. A nossa primeira fala do dia vai ser de Rolando Vasquez, que leciona Sociologia na University College Roosevelt e é afiliado ao Departamento de Estudos de Gênero e ao ICOM, Instituto de Pesquisa Cultural da University of Utrecht. Foi curador do workshop Encenando o Fim do Contemporâneo. Desde 2019, com Walter Mignolo, é, coordena o Middelburg de Colonial Summer School. Seu trabalho busca transgredir o domínio da contemporaneidade e heteronormatividade e da modernidade colonialidade através dos temas de precedência e temporalidades relacionais. Visa contribuir com instituições, epistemologias, estéticas e subjetividades decolonizadoras. Rolando, por favor. Uh, muito obrigado. Thank you very much. I will speak in English. I could speak in Spanish, which is closer to Sao Paulo, but I'll have to speak in English for the lack of Portuguese. Um, I will um, first start with uh, expressing my gratitude to André, Natalia, the organizing team, and this house and this land. My talk, um, sorry, I will just put some uh, time so that I don't get lost in the time. Um, my talk will be, I also want to thank the translator into sign language. <laughs> thank you. And the translators into, into Portuguese. Um, my talk is entitled The End of the Contemporary, the Coloniality and the Task of Listening. It is divided in three steps. The first step, is about the question of the contemporary, bringing the contemporary into question. The second step is about the relation between the end of the contemporary and the colonial aesthetics. And the third part of the talk will be about the task of listening. Well, as you well know, the contemporary is a defining term for the arts, for museums, for curatorial practices, for magazines. So it is all over and it takes the place of the obvious. It seems to be about the, just the now. It, is, it presents itself as all-encompassing. The global contemporary that emerged towards the end of the 80s tried to address the question of the contemporary being Western-centered and expanded the idea of the contemporary all over the world. However, the contemporary itself remained unquestioned. 
I want to say that, in my view, the contemporary is not an innocuous term. It is an instrument of, the, of what I have called the modern politics of time. It functions as an axe of differentiation, very much in the way race and gender are axes of differentiation. It creates a difference between the self and the other. The contemporary can be read as a power over the definition of the now. So it takes the obviousness of the now, but actually what I'm saying is that it holds the power and the pretension to define the now. So I will use uh, the decolonial framework to go through the question of the contemporary. So at the first moment, which is the moment of its modernity, so in, in the way we use the decolonial, we speak of modernity, coloniality together, and we differentiate the moment of modernity from the moment of coloniality. So the contemporary in its, contem in its modernity has the function of regulating and sanctioning, sanctioning the space of appearance, determining the terms of recognition, setting the field of representation. So in that sense, the contemporary works in this power that modernity holds of establishing a historical reality. But there is no modernity without colonial, coloniality, as our late friend uh, Aníbal Quijano said. And so we need to ask, what is the coloniality of the contemporary? If it holds the power of defining the now, what is its coloniality? Its coloniality, I would say, is that power of excluding, of disavowing, of erasing, of rendering out of place others by assigning them to its pastness, the pastness of the contemporary. Other aesthetics, other forms of sensing, of other forms of worlding the world are displaced, put out of place of the contemporary and assigned to its pastness. Here you already see its tremendous power to constitute what we call the colonial difference. The colonial difference when seen through the question of the contemporary is a difference that appears between the self as that which holds the property and the control over the present and the other, an alterity that is defined as, its, as the pastness of this dominant self. So this is not to say that many of the works that have appeared in contemporary institutions do not contain the colonial content or alternative temporalities. But what I am here saying is that when they are subsumed under the narrative of the contemporary, their decolonial content uh, remains marginal, marginal to the narrative of the contemporary. They are just aggregated as belonging to the now, to the global now of contemporaneity. In the case of, for example, the famous exhibition, Magician de la Terre, uh, Magicians of the Air that happened in late 80s in Paris. So in that way, the contemporary functions against the possibility of constructing alternative genealogies, decolonial genealogies, and other constellations through which we can relate to alternative aesthetics, or what we will call aesthetics. So this is the first part that is bringing to question the contemporary. We could elaborate a bit more if, if we have time. Then I will move on to the second part, that is, what is this connection to the colonialist thesis, 
and to the, precisely to the call of the end of the contemporary. So the end of the contemporary is, is against the logic of the global contemporary, against this logic of, ex, of an expansion of the modern politics of time, of the globalization of the modern politics of time. The end of the contemporary is patently not a post or an after the contemporary. So we are not saying the post-contemporary because it will be to fall again into the logic of the contemporary, right? So we are saying the end of the contemporary as a way of this essential movement of the coloniality that Walter Mignolo calls delinking, as a movement of delinking of challenging the, what I call the generalized conditions of timelessness. This is, timelessness is the loss of time, the condition of empty time, when we are made to assume that the only temporality that is real is the present, which is the logic of, of the modern politics of time. And engaging, so delinking from this modern temporality, from the temporality of the contemporary, and reconstituting other trajectories. The task of what I call relegating, which is bringing back together, of remembrance, of reconnecting again. In that way, the movement of the colonial aesthetics is not a projection towards the future, but is the task of a healing, of a reconnecting. This is the subtitle of the article uh, uh, I wrote with Walter Mignolo on the colonial thesis that is subtitled uh, the colonial, um, colonial Wounds, the Colonial Healings. So the concern of the end of the contemporary and of the colonial thesis is to go towards this task of uh, the colonial healing. So working in tandem with the colonial thesis, the end of the contemporary seeks to activate other temporalities and enable other trajectories of uh, other trajectories, other constellations, other genealogies of aesthesis. That is of the sensing that is not regulated by the by aesthetics of the West. So under the contemporary, or under contemporaneity, we hear the rumbling of relational times, of relational worlds, of relational histories. And here I will refer to the work of Patricia Kersenhout that is on the screen, the soul of salt, that was uh, presented this year in Manifesta 12 in Palermo, at the Palazzo for, for Cella de Seta. And this work, I will read a little extract of how Patricia Kersenhout, a uh, Dutch artist from Suriname's background, uh, describes this work. Just to put an example of what we mean by the colonial thesis. She says, the sea salt refers to the salt which slaves refrain from eating so they could fly back to Africa. But it also stands symbol for mental and physical liberation. It refers to slaves crossing the salt water of the Atlantic Ocean on their way to plantations. It's the salt of all the tears shed during slavery and colonialism. The mountain of 7,500 kilos of sea salt depicts the suffering, but also the hopes and dreams of people. I think what we see here in the work of Patricia Kersenhout is paradigmatic of what we mean by the colonial thesis. Because it connects the suffering under coloniality with the hope of decoloniality. It is, I will say, using the temporality of the salt as remembrance, 
a temporality that is capable of remembering and not a temporality that is just looking towards the future, towards novelty. It is a temporality, what I call, in precedence. The idea of precedence is an idea that, that is developed through listening to First Nations philosophies of, that are common in this respect across Abiyayala, what, uh, what the West has called the Americas. And it names a temporality that is not divided between, in, that is not ordered in the chronology of past, present, and future. It is also not about a circular temporality. So it's not a linear and it's not a circular temporality, both of them geometrical representations of time of the West. The temporality of precedence speaks of the time that precedes. And the time that precedes is a time that precedes because it is ahead of us, and it is only ahead of us because it comes from before us. So precedence carries this notion of time in which time precedes us, and that is why it is ahead of us. It is also contained in the notion of an ancestrality that is awaiting an ancestrality that is related to a posterity. So you see here, we don't have an ordering of time from past to future, where the past is gone and the future is an always to come projection. But we have a grounding activity, a grounding aesthesis that recognizes that the self is not trapped in the present, in the instant of the present, but that belongs to a deeper temporality that precedes us, and that's why we can speak, for example, because language precedes us, and in its precedence, it is also marking the way towards a posterity. And very particular for us, it carries an ethics of justice. That's why we speak of colonial wounds, decolonial healings, because the wounds are still open in their precedence, and they are calling for justice, they are calling from a di for a different historical configuration. I will make a small parenthesis to say why we speak of the colonial aesthesis in contrast with the colonial aesthetics. It is from the work of Walter Mignolo, uh, who coined the term the colonial aesthesis to challenge the way. Um, the way Western aesthetics from Kant and Baumgarten have been attempting to regulate the beautiful and the sublime. That's why we are speaking of decolonizing aesthetics to liberate aesthetics. You see already the connection between aesthetics and contemporaneity and the need of the end of the contemporary to liberate aesthetics. Now, for us also, it is very important to say that this discussion of aesthetics and the end of the contemporary is relevant for the arts, but goes beyond the arts. It is an opportunity to think through the arts and the functioning of contemporaneity to begin seeing how uh, modernity coloniality has been regulating the production of the subject by controlling the senses, by controlling perception, and by reducing experience to the present of the now. The challenge of the colonial aesthetics is that of exiting the empty time of modernity its enclosure. So modernity, as somebody like Walter Men Benjamin so is engaged in producing an empty time, functions through an empty time, the empty time of the now, of novelty, of the commodity. In response to this, we speak about the emergence of relational temporalities. 
We think that the colonialist thesis and the end of the contemporary can be enabling the position and the possibility of a subject that is not anymore an individualized self, a self that is confined to the present of the now, but that will be enabling the possibility of a polyphonic self or polyph polyphonic selves that are capable of mirroring other worlds and not just being trapped in a in the monoculture of modernity. So decoloniality, this is another one of the big premises of modern decoloniality. Decoloniality as delinking moves towards a horizon that is in excess of modernity. So meaning that the decolonial is not searching to become modern is not searching to become contemporary, right? This is one of the big difference with a lot of the post-colonial strategies. The decolonial doesn't have as its horizon the modern or the contemporary. As Maria Lugones will say, we are seeking to go beyond resistance, not just to be placed in the logic of resisting power in order to control power, but going beyond the logic of resistance. So challenging power to delink from it, to enable other possible worlds. I will move to the third section that is about the task of listening. That is one of the responses to what we see as possible under the end of the contemporary. and one of the possibilities of going beyond contemporaneity. So there is two important aspects in the task of listening. One, first I will start by uh, showing how listening can function as critique, as a distinct form of critical thought. And secondly, how listening points towards a form of transformation of what uh, Raoul Fornet Betancourt calls the anthropological transformation. So first, listening as critique. Unlike the tradition of critical thought from the West, listening as critique is engaged with the colonial difference. The critical tradition of the West is very important for us, but it is, first it doesn't carry the question of the colonial difference. So the big canonical authors of the West, such as Adorno or Foucault or Deleuze, they, don't, they have wonderful thought, but they don't have the question of coloniality. They are not engaged with the colonial difference. Second, the tradition of critique of the West is often engaged in a meta-theoretical exercise and on, an, on the praise of self-reflexivity. So it is just about reflecting with itself. So it is an internal dialogue of the West. When we say that we propose an idea of critique as listening. We speak of the possibility of listening beyond the colonial difference. How can we listen beyond the framework of intelligibility of modernity? How can we listen beyond contemporaneity? How can we listen to what has been silence? Can the museums like this one that have been instrumental in the formation of the colonial difference, engage in exercises of listening across the colonial difference? Could this be a principle of curatorial practice?
So you see the challenge when we think of listening um, as critique is the challenge of going beyond our comfort zone, our framework of certainties, and begin truly listening to what is beyond what we know, what has been made irrelevant by coloniality. The second movement of listening that I want to point out is listening as a decolonial horizon, as a way of transforming our ways of being in the world, of worlding the world, of being earth bodies, of being communal in time. It is, I think, a way towards some sort of what Raoul Fournette calls anthropological transformation. So the transformation of subjectivity. Because one of the pillars of the control of modern coloniality has been the subjectification and the subjection of people. Subjectification on this side of the colonial difference, in the inside, and subjection at the other side of the colonial difference. So the Tojolabales, who are First Nations from Chiapas, and, uh, and who speak the language called Tojolabal, that is one of the Mayan languages, a language that uh, Carlos Lenkersdorf says may have started 2,000 years before Christ. So in a sense, a language that has a completely different genealogy of Western languages, and that is what I called the outside of modernity because it doesn't belong to the genealogy of the West. Doesn't mean it's not in contact with modernity, but it means it has a completely different root than all Western languages. For the Tojolabales, as Lenkers of put it, puts it, it is nonsensical to speak of the spoken word, word without the listened word. So you cannot just speak about what you speak, the spoken word, without also engaging in listening. They say dominant society is unable to listen, unable to listen to others, to the earth, to our pl plurality, internal plurality. In that sense, modern society or the individualized subject is actually lives in separation. This subject in its subjectification is separated from community, from proximate and distant community, is separated from earth, and is separated from an interior pl plurality. The modern society, Western modern colonial society, has been fixated on the control of enunciation. The control of enunciation is one of its fundamental powers and has dismissed the importance of listening, the importance of reception. When we are trained through the universities, for example, we are trained as enunciators, how to hold this power of enunciation. We are subjectivized into it. In contrast, the Tojolabal way, way of listening is what we might call a relationality in practice. It is a challenge to the separation between the self and the other that is so essential to the configuration of the modern self, of modern time, of gender, of whiteness. It is about being in relation. It is about not the I as a model of being in the world, but as a we-ing. In Spanish, nosotreidad. It is a practice of nosotros, of the we against the practice of the sovereign self, the self that is made in the image of the master of the plantation or in the image of the corporation, the consumer. So what happens when we go in the consumer society to the supermarket 
we are practicing that self that is capable of consuming the world as a sovereign self. And here is where I want to introduce what I've been calling the ethical question that is the guiding question of these reflections. The ethical question says, can we live an ethical life in a world in which our well-being, our sense of self, is dependent on the suffering of others and on the wasting away of earth? For me, this is one of the most pressing questions that we have today that has no easy answer. And decoloniality is engaged with in the challenge of thinking through it. Right? So it's not just the master, not just the dictator, but it's also the consumer in the supermarket that is practicing this subjectivity, that enjoys the consumption of life of others, and that enjoys the consumption of earth. So here the response of the of listening as a practice of relationality is a movement of transformation from the modern colonial order towards a decolonial horizon, from a logic of disposing, disposing of life towards a logic of disposition, of putting oneself at the service of life, of the care of life. It is moving from the enunciation of modernity that is always a projecting forward towards the listening that is a gathering in precedence, a caring for. It is a movement from the enclosure of the I to the we-ing in the infinitive as a verbality. from the individualized self to the polyphonic selves. From the logic of appropriation of modernity in general, of capital in particular, of the consumer, to the logic of reception, of becoming broader than the eye, of opening up. I will conclude by saying, in relation to the question of the contemporary, that you can globalize the contemporary and remain contemporary, but you cannot decolonize the contemporary and remain contemporary. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado, Rolando. A próxima, a próxima fala vai ser com Luciana Balestrin, bacharel em Ciências Sociais pela Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, mestre em Ciência Política pela Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul também, e doutora em Ciências Políticas pela Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, tendo realizado o estágio doutoral na Universidade de Coimbra. Atualmente é professora adjunta de Ciências Políticas do curso de Relações Internacionais e do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciências Políticas na Universidade Federal de Pelotas. Atua e investiga na área de teoria política contemporânea, especialmente sobre democracia, violência e pós-colonialismo. Por favor. Bom dia. Em primeiro lugar, eu gostaria de agradecer imensamente o convite para a participação desse seminário. É uma grande honra, um prazer enorme uh, poder estar aqui hoje para debatar, para debater a proposta desse encontro. É, eu não posso deixar de parabenizar também a iniciativa e a concepção é, desse seminário, né, a sua impecável é, organização e acolhida, Particularmente agradecer ao convite do Pedro, do André, a receptividade da equipe como um todo, Isadora, Natália, pelo trato tão cuidadoso. Em tempos de brutalidade e embrutecimento, a delicadeza não deixa de ser uma forma de resistência. Eu começo justificando a mudança do rumo da minha intervenção de hoje. Ela se deveu ao contexto eleitoral presidencial do Brasil atual, 
especialmente porque ele reforça um diagnóstico que eu trabalho desde 2016, qual seja o de que estamos vivenciando uma onda global e nacional de desdemocratização aberta para novos tipos e experimentos de autoritarismo no século XXI. Quando eu comecei a estudar o pós-colonialismo e a perspectiva decolonial, há dez anos atrás, na Universidade de Coimbra, inclusive tive a oportunidade, na época, de assistir uma palestra é, do professor Nelson Maldonado Torres, que está aqui hoje, uh, no Centro de Estudos Sociais, uh, as democracias liberais uh, ainda não demonstravam tão fortemente seus sinais de agonia. No contexto latino-americano, inclusive, a consolidação democrática era aprofundada, em alguns casos, com experiências participativas nacionais pelos governos da chamada Maré Rosa ou Left Turn. Dito em outras palavras, certa agenda de descolonização foi ressignificada e atualizada na América Latina, sobretudo a partir da experiência da região andina, em um contexto muito particular de estabilidade democrática regional. Após uma década, o contexto político e econômico global e regional mudou significativamente. Assim, por ocasião do presente seminário, eu deduzi que a minha contribuição Uh, poderia vir muito mais é, da minha área de atuação, uh, que é um campo interdisciplinar das relações internacionais e da ciência política, e mais especificamente falando, o campo da teoria política democrática e pós-colonial. Uh, peço desculpas, porque o meu computador ele acabou de uh, estragar, e eu tenho aqui um, uma carta na manga no meu celular, então... Eu vou uh, seguindo aqui, aparecem coisas que não deveriam. É, bom, o que eu gostaria, então, de propor e tentar defender hoje aqui é a seguinte ideia. É, no âmbito propositivo, prático e teórico, o projeto decolonial ele precisa estar comprometido com o um projeto político-democrático. Eu apoio em algumas constatações, em algumas premissas, para enxergar isso como uma necessidade cada vez mais urgente. A mudança radical do contexto no qual o giro decolonial foi pensado, a inexistência de uma teoria democrática pós-colonial e de uma teoria pós-colonial democrática, capazes de estabelecer o cruzamento das agendas da descolonização e da democracia, uma nova ofensiva neocolonial discursivamente despudorada como epifenômeno da proliferação de discursos anti-humanistas, por mais que saibamos da seletividade e do eurocentrismo do humanismo, a ausência de uma discussão democrática mais sistemática no âmbito do giro decolonial. No atual contexto do avanço de um novo tipo de fascismo, essa ausência se torna ainda mais problemática, sobretudo porque as sociedades pós-coloniais não estão imunes à violência fascista pelo passado de violência colonial. Em certo sentido, elas podem, inclusive, ser, ser potencializadas umas às outras. É, Para trabalhar, então, com essa ideia, minha exposição ela tem o título do pós-colonialismo após democracia, os limites da democracia liberal na América Latina e o desafio do giro decolonial. Eu divido ela em três partes. Nessa primeira parte, eu gostaria de falar sobre a falência do modelo da democracia liberal em um contexto global, sobretudo para pensar dois aspectos principais. O primeiro, novas dinâmicas de desdemocratização e autoritarização, e segundo, brechas nessas novas dinâmicas para a reabilitação de um discurso neocolonial apoiado no contexto da governança neoliberal. Na segunda, eu quero pensar que a agonia da democracia liberal nos centros já foi experimentada em diferentes sentidos nas sociedades pós-coloniais, especialmente na América Latina, e que justamente por isso precisamos elaborar uma contra-história da democracia, da, da democracia liberal. Por fim, eu quero sustentar e defender, argumentar que o projeto decolonial ele precisa enfrentar, teoricamente, a dimensão democrática e um sentido político. O conceito de descolonização não pode se transformar em um significante tão esvaziado e vazio, e ele não pode ser banalizado. 
A agonia é, da democracia liberal e a abertura experimental para novos projetos autoritários é, tem, nesse ano de 2018, é, um ano representativo, porque ele demonstra, talvez, o um enfrentamento da sua maior cri crise global desde o final da Guerra Fria. É, esse fenômeno ele se alastra do norte ao sul global e trata-se da gente compreender a crise das democracias liberais não somente como uma crise de representação e desconfiança políticas, mas também como uma crise política e estrutural de modelos históricos e experiências institucionais datados no seu tempo e espaço, incapazes de uma renovação que responda à complexidade e à heterogeneidade das transformações que o presente nos coloca. A crise tem a ver com um conjunto de desequilíbrios, desalinhamentos e tensões provocados pela hegemonia pós-socialista, apoiada na globalização, finalização e neoliberalização do capitalismo. Nesse sentido, dois marcos importantes testaram a capacidade de resposta dessa nova ordem diante sua ameaça e desestabilização. Os atentados terroristas de setembro de 2001 e a crise econômica global de 2008. Em ambos os casos, as respostas foram muito claras. Diminuição da democracia liberal. A democracia liberal também está sendo provocada por ela própria mediante a não superação de suas contradições, paradoxos e limites, especialmente aqueles produzidos a partir da disjunção entre necessidades da economia de mercado e da política democrática, austeridade, desemprego, interdição de direitos civis, políticos e sociais ameaçam em várias partes do mundo garantias democráticas mínimas conquistadas historicamente por diferentes movimentos políticos, inclusive os movimentos de descolonização na sua sequência. As dinâmicas da privatização internacional do poder também impactam na desconfiguração da própria democracia eh, liberal. Nesse sentido, a racionalidade neoliberal é um poderoso mecanismo para a reprodução da lógica da imperialidade. Em artigo publicado no ano passado, eu defendi que não existe colonialidade sem imperialidade e que a governança, sem governo neoliberal, desempenha um importante papel no novo imperialismo sem império. No ano de 2016, a gente teve quatro eventos muito importantes no mundo, do norte ao sul global, que testaram os limites dessa democracia representativa liberal e ocidental. Na Inglaterra, um plebiscito demonstrou a preferência majoritária dos ingleses pela saída da União Europeia. Na Colômbia, um referendo pelo acordo de paz com as Farc foi rejeitado pela maioria. Nos Estados Unidos, uma vitória inusitada elegeu o empresário milionário Donald Trump para a presidência da maior potência mundial e representante do imperialismo sem império. Por fim, no Brasil, um controverso processo de impeachment foi aprovado para a destituição da ex-presidenta reeleita, e, uh, no mundo globalizado neoliberal, essas consultas populares sinalizaram pelo menos a rejeição do multiculturalismo, da integração regional e a tolerância aos outros, alertando que, os, que as condições de emergência dos discursos fascistas são gestadas nas brechas dos discursos democráticos liberais. Uh, esses quatro episódios, eles, uh, três deles são localizados no continente americano e cada qual, à sua maneira, também demonstra que uh, a emergência dos discursos abertamente autoritários e antidemocráticos podem ser legitimados pelo voto popular, partidos políticos e ou lideranças populistas. E mais, imp mais importante é que a, a, a utilização das instituições democráticas para fragilização, minimização ou ruptura da própria democracia, tem sendo, então, uma constante é, desde então. Né? O Brasil né, se, torna, se tornou, nos últimos cinco anos, um dos exemplos empíricos mais intrigantes para os estudiosos da falência dos regimes democráticos contemporâneos. Imerso em uma crise política desde 2013 e econômica desde 2014, o país protagonista um processo de agonia democrática bastante particular. Alguns comentadores enxergaram em junho de 2013 e outubro de 2018 o fim da nova república pactuada em 1988. 
uh, com efeito desde 2016, com o impeachment da ex-presidenta Dilma, seguido pela pre, uh, prisão do sucessor favorito para a disputa presidencial, o ex-presidente Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, e da ascensão meteórica de Bolsonaro por um partido insignificante, a democracia brasileira entrou um sinal de alerta para a comunidade internacional. Ainda que não possa ser considerado necessariamente um outsider, Uh, por sua longa trajetória parlamentar de quase 30 anos, Jair Bolsonaro é saudosista da ditadura civil-militar brasileira, proferindo vários discursos anti-humanistas que afrontam o maior período democrático da história desse país. O caso brasileiro endossa a tese de desdemocratização e autoritarização como um processo gradual, reabrindo a ferida das sociedades pós-coloniais fundadas na violência colonial e na negação do outro colonizado. A transformação dos Estados Unidos e, muito provavelmente, do Brasil em algo que poderemos chamar no futuro de democracias autoritárias traz a questão... Quem são e serão os novos condenados da Terra? Quem são e serão as suas maiores vítimas? Como haverá a combinação de elementos entre governança, neoliberalismo, neocolonialismo e militarismo? Bem, o segundo ponto traz a necessidade de uma contra-história da democracia liberal. É, as promessas da democracia liberal, elas vêm sendo questionadas pelo entendimento de que o neoliberalismo é um fenômeno totalizante com potencial totalitário. É como se esse processo fosse uma consequência não esperada e não intencionada do filho econômico, emancipada com racionalidade colonizadora do próprio liberalismo. Após 2008, o debate sobre distopia e fim da história retornou com força e as democracias de maior intensidade ou qualidade começaram a experimentar um modelo incerto e desconhecido para a sua realidade. Nos últimos anos, o crescente interesse sobre o fenômeno do neoliberalismo começou a ser observado para além das suas implicações na esfera política. Um, a gente tem um, uma descrição de um fenômeno totalizante, quase totalitário, pela sua radicalidade, fundamentalismo e capacidade de absorção de seus antagonistas, uh, produzindo impactos profundos nos modos de so sociabilidade e subjetividade humanas. O experimento neoliberal ele foi testado pela primeira vez na América Latina, no contexto de uma das ditaduras mais violentas da região. Justamente na primeira década do século XXI, quando a América Latina protagonizou o giro à esquerda e o giro decolonial se projeta uh, na academia, a resposta ao neoliberalismo radical, implementada na década anterior, trouxe os regimes que a gente pode definir como regimes pós-neoliberais. Um, bem, é interessante observar que, diferentemente do norte global, a América Latina aprofundava sua democracia uh, e, inclusive, passava, né, de certa maneira, a construir tentativas de estado de bem, estar social, aumentando, inclusive, a migração dos migrantes do norte é, para o sul. É, uma contra-história da democracia liberal envolve questionar as fundações e os mitos de origem da democracia e do liberalismo. Uma das estratégias possíveis é expor o lado obscuro e oculto de seu funcionamento nas ex-colônias europeias, para evidenciar as contradições, os paradoxos e as limitações dos direitos individuais, civis e políticos. É preciso se perguntar até onde foi e vai o compromisso do liberalismo realmente existente com o direito à vida fora das metrópoles, e se o evidente descompromisso não é um indicador válido para atribuirmos a outros movimentos sociais e políticos, que não liberal, a garantia de certas uh, garantias. Democracias e liberalismos realmente existentes foram, desde o princípio, seletivos e parciais em suas transposições ou, nas, ou nascimentos transatlânticos. A tradição violenta do colonialismo expõe não somente o custo da destruição das vidas e das subjetividades em uma atemporalidade imensurável, como também o custo da ocultação das histórias paralelas e entrelaçadas que o permitiram funcionar como um sistema. 
Issa Chividi, autor tanzaniano, nos lembra que o modelo filosófico da democracia liberal é assentado em várias abstrações e separações e que o colonialismo era tudo menos democrático. A Chile Mambembe lembra que os Estados Unidos, país mitológico da democracia liberal, foi um Estado e uma democracia de escravos, uma democracia racista, literalmente. As democracias modernas possuem um corpo solar e um corpo noturno. O corpo noturno, segundo Mabembe, oculta sua tolerância com formas de violência e brutalidade. E tem nos impérios coloniais e nos estados escravagistas os principais símbolos de sua face noturna. Entendo com Mabembe que é preciso conhecer os corpos noturnos nas nossas democracias para que possamos refundá-las em outras bases que consideram não somente os aspectos políticos e institucionais. Essa leitura nos desonera de um tributo obrigatório a ser pago ao liberalismo, como se a sobrevivência do indivíduo fosse por ele incondicionalmente garantida e igualmente respeitada. Uma leitura pós-colonial do liberalismo e da democracia nos permite compreender a constante presença da violência no seu cenário de possibilidade e desconstruir o mito da paz democrática, aquele segundo qual duas democracias nunca guerrearam entre si. Permite-nos também questionar sobre o significado da expressão de soberania popular no passado e no presente, assim como o sujeito democrático que foi privilegiado na história e nas teorias da democracia. A minha terceira parte faz, então, um convite ao debate para pensarmos o projeto decolonial democrático, e não necessariamente um projeto democrático colonial, decolonial. É, no caso da América, América Latina, em particular, a história democrática se revelou bastante pendular. É, inserido nessa história, o Brasil acompanha exemplos característicos dos diferentes ciclos políticos do continente. A metáfora do pêndulo igualmente sinaliza o caráter cíclico dos períodos democráticos no país, com a notícia preocupante de que ele atualmente é movido pela direção dos ventos autoritários que rumam do norte. A trajetória da democracia, do liberalismo e do neoliberalismo marcada e atravessada pela continuidade e resiliência do poder colonial, a colonialidade, tornou a trajetória da democracia neoliberal no continente perigosamente provisória e, em certo sentido, natimorta. Por suas contradições históricas, o liberalismo que se desenvolveu nos países empobrecidos nunca apostou na democracia como seu par indispensável. Isso porque autoritarismo e liberalismo conviveram relativamente bem na América Latina, Latina e no Brasil em um ambíguo e constante flerte junto ao Estado Nacional. A atuação do projeto, a atualização do projeto anti-pós-decolonial uh, precisa, ao meu ver, dialogar muito profundamente com o projeto democrático pra, pro, para poder problematizar o seu conteúdo neoliberal, ser capaz de responder ao fascismo tropical ascendente e vincular no horizonte normativo de refundação um projeto de descolonização, descolonização com um projeto democrático não exclusivamente liberal. Essa necessidade da construção de uma grande de dimensão democrática vinculante ao projeto decolonial se torna mais evidente quando pensamos que, e nos anos uh, 60, no projeto terceiro mundista, a questão democrática não estava colocada. Libertação, independência e descolonização, quando olhamos... Uh, retrospectivamente e teleologicamente, o tricontinentalismo e o movimento dos não, não alinhados não necessariamente fizeram é, da inflexão decolonial na geopolítica bipolar da Guerra Fria um projeto democrático. Então, me parece desejável, desculpa, me parece indesejável que qualquer tipo de redição do projeto terceiro mundista não leve em conta a perspectiva feminista para a segurança e o desenvolvimento, por exemplo. Ainda há algo de muito militarizado, masculino e violento em um certo registro tricontinental dos anos 50 e 60. Uma leitura crítica pós-colonial da democracia liberal desorganiza a história da evolução democrática no Ocidente, tanto para as ex-metrópoles quanto para as ex-colônias. É nessa desorganização que se pode reconstruir e refundar uma teoria democrática que não possua condições de convivência com a violência colonial e as suas heranças. Não por acaso, a metáfora da vida e da morte tem sido utilizada por diferentes autores 
para caracterizar o projeto provisório da vida democrática em, dis, em diferentes contextos. Uh, é preciso, assim, uh, que a vida, a morte e o renascimento das democracias sejam pensados levando em consideração alguns parâmetros e padrões das sociedades pós-coloniais e do sul global. Lembra-se que a metáfora do sul acentua o passado colonial compartilhado na condição de colonizado, economias vulneráveis e dependentes pela sua inserção dependente no sistema mundo, injustiça estrutural de não reparação histórica dos diferentes tipos de violência colonial e persistência de desigualdades devido à resiliência do poder colonial e sua não superação. Se colonialismo e autoritarismo são duas faces da mesma moeda, descolonização e democracia também deve ser de modo a não ser autorizado a convivência entre democracia e colonialismo. Se a dimensão democrática é a antítese do fascismo por excelência, ela também precisa ser a antítese do colonialismo. O colonialismo gera outros padrões de violência e autoritarismo. Podem democracias liberais conter a violência fascista e colonial, mas não são elas justamente que estão a forjar os novos tipos de autoritarismo, fascismo e colonialismo 2.0? Lembremos a interpretação de Amé Césaire sobre o nazismo, o colonialismo aplicado à própria Europa. Ele foi perturbador. O que fez de Hitler um homem imperdoável não foi um crime em si, o crime contra o homem. Não, não foi, foi a humilhação do homem em si, foi o crime contra um homem branco. A crise da democracia liberal é uma crise mais ampla, é uma crise do Ocidente, do, eu, eu, do eurocentrismo, da modernidade colonial e de suas contradições mais profundas. A criação de novos modelos e instituições não somente precisam ser baseadas na ideia de demodiversidade, como também uma profunda reflexão a respeito dos valores indispensáveis e indissociáveis das nossas instituições práticas da vida democrática e descolonizada. Um novo projeto democrático não pode ser repensado sem as sociedades pós-coloniais e sob as bases do liberalismo. Ele deve confrontar as raízes mais profundas da violência colonial e da sua atualização protofascista. Os conceitos de pós-colonialismo e pós-democracia devem ser trabalhados com muito cuidado quando pensamos a América Latina e, particularmente, o Brasil. A heterodoxia de suas trajetórias questiona o próprio experimento da democracia liberal no continente, devido ao seu alto potencial de convivência com dinâmicas antidemocráticas e antiliberais. O desafio do giro decolonial na América Latina é incorporar a democracia em seu horizonte teórico e propositivo. A arte, nesse sentido, pode ser uma das grandes aliadas desse projeto. Eu tenho certeza que, com esse seminário, o MASP, nas figuras do André e do Pedro, uh, já é um grande aliado nessa proposta. É isso. Bom, a partir de agora dessa última fala da mesa, alguns funcionários do museu, vestidos de preto, vão ficar em volta da plateia para iniciar o recolhimento das perguntas para a nossa mesa de debates. A próxima fala será de Nelson Maldonado Torres, professor de estudos latinos e caribenhos e de literatura comparada da Rutgers University. Suas publicações incluem Against War, Views from the Other Side of the Modernity e a coletânea de ensaios La Descolonización e o Giro Decolonial, compilada pela Universidade de La Terra, em 2011. Ele também foi editor convidado de edições especiais sobre mapeamento do giro decolonial para o periódico Transmodernity. Trabalha atualmente na edição de uma antologia de feminismos decoloniais latino-americanos, junto com Ioderques Espinosa e Maria Lugones, e no projeto de outros dois livros, Theorizing the Decolonial Turn and Fanonian Meditations. Por favor, Nelson. Thank you very much for the introduction and the presentation. Uh, I mean, for the invitation to join this wonderful um, event, uh, thinking with other colleagues about art and decolonization. I also, my native language is Spanish, and Spanish I will probably be able to communicate with many of you who are uh, Portuguese speakers, but for the purposes of, of the meeting I'm using second language, which is uh, English, 
and uh, with a Puerto Rican accent. So my presentation is entitled Visual Coloniality and the Crucible of Modern Colonial Space and Time, Notes on the Coloniality of Being and the Colonial Aesthetics as it is reflected there, and I want to begin with a sort of um, couple of epigraphs to the presentation, uh, images and words to keep in mind through the presentation. And let me see how I can make this work. So this is an image that appeared in a satirical, political si satire magazine uh, in 1880. 99, January of 1899, just one year after the end of the Hispanic American War and the US annexation of, of Hawaii. And uh, as part of the end, the arrangement to end the Spanish American War, the US got a number of possessions from Spain, two of which were Philippines and Puerto Rico. And in this, uh, and in this image, you see that Puerto Rico, Cuba, Hawaii, and the Philippines are seated, are the children seated right in front of the teacher. If you keep looking at the picture, you see that there is African-American, a black, at this time, uh, you know, a black kid um, cleaning the windows, and there is a native kid reading a book next to the entrance, but it says ABC, but it is the other way around, right? So, um, and then there is an Asian uh, kid also ne next to the door, right? On the, on, the, on the outside of the door. And then of course are the, uh, for the most part, uh, ladies and kids, you know, male and female children who uh, they have books and each book represents a state. So that, that's like the state of the union. The blackboard on, on the back reads, the consent of the governed is a good thing in theory, but very rare in fact. England has governed her colonies whether they consented or not. By not waiting for their consent, she has greatly advanced the world's civilization. The U.S. must govern its new territories with or without their consent until they can govern themselves. Other parts of the, like in the book, you, you know, everything has, you know, there, are, there is text in different parts of the image. Uh, in the lesson plan, he says, now, children, you have got to learn these lessons, whether you want to or not, but just take a look at the class ahead of you and remember that in a little while you will feel as glad to be here as they are. And it also the book reads, the cover of the book, U.S. First Lessons in Self-Government. So I want to use this image as a background and then also think about uh, the U.S., Keep thinking about the U.S., but going even uh, be before 1899 um, to the very settlement of the territory by the Anglos. And this is a reflection from Rosanne Dunbar Ortiz, author of Indigenous People's History of the U.S., and it reads, in the frontier wars between 1607 and 1814, Americans forged two elements, unlimited war and irregular war, into their first way of war, which is still their way of war. I make throughout the book connections between the U.S. military today and its foundation in these unrelenting wars that actually went up through 1890, these wars, and then moved overseas to the Philippines and the Caribbean with the same generals in the Philippines who had been fighting the Sioux and the Cheyenne in the northern plains. So of course, she's indicating a connection uh, between certain ways of approaching indigenous populations in the continental US and this other expedition and wars. Very direct connection. 
and she's pointing to the existence of something like a war paradigm that has been part of the U.S. Constitution of the very makings of the U.S. as a nation state. If we jump to the 20th century, um, it is not rare then to find some of those Puerto Ricans, you know, I want to raise the question, what happened with the, what happened with the kid? What happened with the Puerto Rican kid there? The Puerto Rican kid is the second uh, from right to left. And so with this in mind, I want to take you to a piece of poetry by a Puerto Rican, New Yorican, Puerto Rican Pedro Pietri, and it's called Puerto Rican Obituary. And Obituary, of course, brings up the theme of, of death, of being death alive, and the poetry reads they work, they were always on time, they were never late, they never spoke back. When they were insulted, they worked, they never took days off that were not on the calendar, they never went on strike without permission, they worked 10 days a week and were only paid for five. They worked, they worked, they worked, and they died. They died broke, they died owing, they died never knowing what the front entrance of the first national city bank looks like. There is a short video with Pedro Pietri uh, reciting the poetry. I don't know if we can make it work because, I, I, can we make it work, someone in? They were never late. They never spoke back when they were insulted. They worked. They never went on strike about permission. They never took days off that were not on the calendar. They worked 10 days a week and were only paid for five. They work, they work, they work and they died. They died broke. They died owing. They died never knowing what the front entrance of the first National City Bank looks like. Juan, Miguel, Milagro, Olga, Manuel, all die yesterday, today, and will die again tomorrow, passing their bill collectors on to the next of kin all die waiting for the Garden of Eden to open up again under a new management. All die dreaming about America, waking them up in the middle of the night, screaming, Mira, Mira, your name is on the winning lottery ticket for $100,000. All die hating the grocery stores that sold them make-believe steak and bulletproof rice and beans. All die dreaming, hating, and waiting. Dead Puerto Ricans who never knew they were Puerto Ricans who never took a coffee break from the Ten Commandments to kill, kill, kill the landlords of their cracked skulls and communicate with their Latin souls. Juan, Miguel, Milagro, Olga, Manuel, from the nervous breakdown street where the mice live like millionaires and the people do not live at all. In the poem, uh, the poem continues and what you heard him um, reciting were also parts of these uh, fragments here of the poem. Juan, Miguel, Milagros, Olga, Manuel. And this is very important. That's why I'm highlighting it. It has to do with temporality. All died yesterday, today, and will die again tomorrow. Yeah. Passing their bill collectors onto the next of kin, all died waiting for the Garden of Eden to open up again under the new management. All died dreaming about America, waking them up in the middle of the night, screaming, Mira, Mira, your name is on the winning lottery ticket for $100,000, all died hating the grocery stores that sold them make-believe steak and bulletproof rice and beans, all died waiting, dreaming, and hating. Dead Puerto Ricans who never knew they were Puerto Ricans, who never took a coffee break from the Ten Commandments to kill, kill, kill the landlords of their cracked skulls and communicate with their Latino souls. And I went from these lines and, uh, uh, of Pedro uh, Pietri's poetry to then jump um, from the late 20th century to uh, the last few years in, in Puerto Rico, because the theme of death had become you know, continuously relevant. And of course, you know now about the, the, the destruction of Puerto Rico by Hurricane Maria and how that has exposed the colonial condition of the island, that in effect, Puerto Rico uh, has had more difficulty in a way being able to restructure uh, its conditions and to address its conditions has had more difficulty under the U.S. than if it had not been a territory of the U.S. And so uh, there has been a continuous delay and uh, that has led to, of, of help of actually addressing the situation, which has led to uh, mounting, mount, you know, uh, multiple amount of deaths 
deaths uh, raising to almost 3,000 in the last count because of the hurricane. But before the hurricane, Puerto Rico faced a, and is facing a massive debt uh, that's basically an unpayable debt. And a debt that even though what you hear in the mainstream US uh, from Obama to Trump is that this is largely due uh, to mismanagement and corruption. The truth is that if you look back when Bill Clinton was in power and Bill Clinton wanted to, um, to reconcile the budget, right? To, to, uh, to, to eliminate the deficit in the US, he began to transform many programs and that included take away the few opportunities that were in the island for you know, attracting uh, investment from the US. And so as that expired, because Bill Clinton brought it down, uh, it was predictable that the companies will begin to go on with that, their jobs. And if you read newspapers from the time, we're predicting a massive debt coming to the island because of those structural and economic adjustments that Bill Clinton implemented. Of course, that is gone. Uh, you know, so be before Hurricane Maria came, there was this hurricane of forgetfulness or ignorance of this kind of issue. So that now, uh, of course, it's the Puerto Ricans themselves who are supposed to be the only responsible. Of course, there is all responsibility uh, enough to spread around, but in a colonial condition, the master, uh, and in this case, is very clear, has to assume the majority of that responsibility. And so even this theme, I'm going to now to shift to someone who collaborated with Pedro Pietri, He's the photographer Adal Maldonado, and Adal Maldonado um, began to work on a series of photographs called Puerto Ricans on the Water. Right? And this actually precedes uh, Hurricane Maria. In a way, they became, uh, this photographic series became, um, like came to be, a lot of attention began to take place after Hurricane Maria because of course it's depicting these Puerto Ricans uh, on the water. Uh, but it was mainly referring to you know, death and the entire situation of living in a context where life cannot continue as usual, right? If you are on the water, you cannot breathe. The theme also of lacking breath is very fundamental uh, in coloniality, right? And so, I'm going to show you a number of photographs, and this one says Junta, and Junta is the control board, right? The control board. It's a control, fiscal control board that uh, Obama put together to legislate the finances uh, of Puerto Rico with basically no, no, you know, it was appointed, it is appointed by the federal government. So it's very literally a demonstration of, of US colonialism now at the fiscal level. Um, so you, these are very stereotypical elements of the Puerto Rican, the typical Puerto Rican that is on the water. Your dreams are on the water. The elite, to some extent, is on the water. And here is that we have to be careful, I think. There, is, there are different kinds of waters. And that's something, I don't know, so far I haven't seen that the, that the photographic series shows, right? Some people are living in clean water, on the water, but the water is cleaner than in other places. Right? And those places when they uh, have, are better prepared for the water to come down and for them to be able to breathe from time to time, other places have been on the water for a long time. Right? culture underwater. She has a Puerto Rican flag tattooed on her belly. And this one says Muerto Rico, which is, you know, instead of Puerto Rico, Muerto Rico means dead Rico. So Muerto is uh, being dead, which again brings up the theme that we found in the poem. Now, so we see, I want to make the connection between war, a paradigm of war, the expansion of the US government, the way in which the US government has related to indigenous peoples and also to its colonies. But I want to bring it up also and connect it with Black Lives Matter um, as well. 
and Black Lives Matter because also is facing right, the conditions of systematic death, of living death, yesterday and today and tomorrow, the theme also of breathing uh, and not having breath have become very important uh, in Black Lives Matter's organizing. Uh, Black Lives Matter emerged because of the activism, you know, it was created by uh, three women, Alisa Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opal Tomeri. And they sort of, they created this, this platform and it has become an entire, you know, a movement with many multiple dimensions. And, and they not only uh, criticize the situation, the condition of the U.S. of uh, the situation with the people that are supposed to protect you, uh, like the police, uh, they are the ones that can sometimes harm you uh, and kill you. But also they have turned, the movement has turned into making policy recommendations policy recommendations. And this is the first policy recommendation uh, by the movement for black lives is precisely end the war on black people. So again, the, the theme of war surfaces. And it reads, we demand an end to the war against black people. Since this country's inception, there have been named and unnamed wars on our communities. We demand an end to the criminalization, incarceration, and killing of our people. This includes, and then it has a series of specific demands. And so what I'm trying to highlight here is that connection between colonial expansion, um, expropriation of territories and genocide, war making on indigenous peoples, and the way in which black subjects uh, are approached to and consider. Right? And so coloniality, for me at least, is a way in which invites one, and actually in a way forces one, to think about these crossings and this relationship. And in my uh, account of coloniality, I sort of highlight precisely the fact that modernity coloniality is a paradigm of war. And so you see that theme throughout these different um, words and images. Now I want to shift from the US itself to Western modernity. The US is only one nation state within Western modernity. And I think that the paradigm of war is uh, central. It's central in the US in part because it's a modern nation state. It's a modern project. But war making, this kind of perpetual war, is uh, a naturalization of war. Um, takes place centrally in the constitution of the modern West. And all its nation states. And all its nation, and all the modern nation states. In different ways. So I want to present you some ideas about approaching coloniality as metaphysical catastrophe. I'm going to explain this. And for me, it is precisely this catastrophe. Catastrophe is a downturn, and it's a downturn to a situation where war becomes a norm instead of an exception. And so I cannot go in detail through all of this, but I think this catastrophe is, uh, for me, defined or anchored in the way in which temporality Spatiality and subjectivity are understood, and in the case of the emergence of Western modernity, it has to do, uh, in effect, with a kind of transformation of the how time, space, and subjectivity were conceived in Christendom, particularly in medieval Christendom. You know the story how sacred time uh, uh, began to be opposed by the value of profane time, sacred space by profane space. And let's say the soul, well, in Christianity was contrasted by the body, but with the uh, uh, humanist revolt that starts to happen in the 15, from 12th to 16th centuries, um, then you find the notion of, of the you know, religious soul vis-a-vis -vis this human being that could be, that can be, and should be elevated and praised in, in itself. And so Pico de la Mirandola was one of those uh, humanists, and he wrote what has become known as the manifesto of that humanist revolution. From the humanist revolution, of course, you have the humanities, you have the concept, the Western concept of the human being, humanitas, and from there you have the idea of the humanities and the, you know, and as a central component of the Western university, and also, I think, of the arts and literature. And so, in the time, Sandro Botticelli was part of this community, and uh, many of you, most of you, maybe all of you, are really familiar with the adoration of the Maggi, where we find the scene of nativity, 
And here you find the kind of how temporality, spatiality, and subjectivity begin to be challenged. That sort of uh, the, the, the time, space, and conception of subjectivity of Christendom begins to be challenged with the sin of nativity, but where in fact you find a number of the Renaissance humanists among the crowd, among the people looking at the um, birth at, at baby Jesus Christ. And so among them, you have Sandro Botticelli himself on the corner, on the right corner, looking back at you. Uh, so even God, which is at the center, the baby, is not like the central point of the picture, like the central point, you know, the, the, the painter himself partly steals um, that centrality in the painting, and a new kind of subjectivity emerges there, right? And so there is a displacement for a certain kind of conception of space, time, and subjectivity to a new one where the painting, the subject, the human being can emerge as a painter and become a protagonist in a story where the painter was circumscribed and the subject was circumscribed. Uh, the, the role of, of the subject was limited to observing and adoring. And now the subject has become a creator and actually it's by virtue of the work of this painter that we can even see the painting. So the painter is a creator of sorts, even in this, you know, even paying uh, some respects to the, to the tradition of Christianity. And so, you know, these are the different figures that belong to members of the Medici family or humanists of the time. This is then, I think, part of that revolution. The human body acquires a particular attention and appreciation. But then that revolution is crossed with another very important series of events. Um, and actually, in a way, the, 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 the mariners and the travelers were challenging uh, Christianity in some way, just like the painters were doing and the, what the literary figures were doing. Right? This was happening in the so-called natural sciences, in expedition, and also in the arts, in the visual arts, and in literature. Now, with, the, with Columbus and the uh, creation of this emergence of this new world order, then the conception of the human takes a more complicated form. You have Columbus and Queen Isabel, 1492. And then later on, you find this painting by uh, Frederick Kemmelmeyer, The First Landing of Christopher Columbus. And I want to look at that uh, painting uh, from early 1900s. And you see, of course, the Spaniards, indigenous people, the boats, the role of the church, right? It's like, uh, you saw even Botticelli still put the um, Christ at the center. Here, the church is there, but the actual protagonist seems to be, are these travelers themselves. And they are not only trying to make them, trying to obtain a definition, a self-identification and identity, vis-a-vis -vis Christianity. They, they seem to be, that relationship seems to be well established, but the relationship that is being defined there that became key is that between this, the travelers and the indigenous peoples, those other bodies in that other part of the, of the land. And so I want you to think about this when you're looking about, about that. How God here uh, is represented by Michelangelo slightly above Adam, and how, in a way, Adam, with you know, the, the position of the body, the comfort, uh, is almost in the same position as God. And the care taking, painting Adam, Adam showing the uh, different, uh, um, you know, the, the, the attention to the details of the body shows, of course, that that subject is worth paying attention to, celebrating in its own way. So there is a closeness there between the divine and uh, the so-called profane. And so look at this again and see then the distance between the conquerors, the travelers, and the Indians is much larger than the one between God and Adam. Adam. So a new world order, I think, you know, is being created where these other bodies are not are both more separated are afar, but also below. They are below and behind. And below and behind is part of, I think, represents visually 
the metaphysical catastrophe, the catastrophe that occurs in this context, where instead of having subjects finding themselves on the same plane with differences, there is another plane altogether that emerges in this context. And it is in relation to those subjects that war can continue, uh, can be naturalized and continue in an unending, un unending ways. What you find in the US, in the formation of the US, is sort of following the script of the spatio-temporal dynamics and the conception of subjectivity that begins to emerge uh, throughout the 15th uh, and the, uh, throughout the 16th, 17th centuries and so on. And you can find, we can go and explore the images. I, cannot, I, I have to keep moving, but to give you an idea, this is a representation of Caliban from Shakespeare, The Tempest. Uh, you can also compare these views of the subject. Uh, this is again below, you know, who is above, who is below. Here's the position of the male and female, white male uh, and female vis-a-vis -vis Caliban. And this leads then to a contrast between the world of Christendom and this new kind of world, where it is not only a division between sacred time and profane, and profane time, that's how it's usually seen uh, from the perspective of the humanist revolution itself, but that there is a third element, a third layer, right, that behind and below that has been created is subjects who are out of time, subjects who are out of space, or who live only in spaces of that nation. That is, we, these subjects are always told to, you know, go back to where you belong, which could be the favela, it could be the barrio, it could be the colony, it could be the space, and also a different modality of consciousness that W.E.B. Du Bois in the U.S. famously called double consciousness. And double consciousness, the feature of this new consciousness, is that the master has installed himself in your mind. You have the master has, in a way, entered your mind and made brutal modifications to your psyche. Of course, that is not the end, uh, but that creates a new kind of psychic, psychological phenomenon. And so coloniality has to do with the creation of a new subjectivity, but also of new temporal and spatial dimensions. That's what I've been calling this catastrophe. I have... Uh, Cody tried to represent in different diagrams. This has already been, been circulated in 2016, so I'm not going to take time. I invite you to look at the outline of 10 theses on coloniality and decoloniality for uh, fleshing out these different aspects. Uh, now I want to turn to the question of decoloniality. Decoloniality. And I want to present decoloniality as counter-metaphysical catastrophe. So it has to do with the radical transformation of time, space, subjectivity, among other areas. I mean, we could stay a long time here, but just to give you indications of counter-catastrophic moves, also at the level of, of art and activism. And this comes from Cape Town, when in March 9, 2015, there was a, a you know, an, an act of throwing human feces to one of this, uh, the statue of Cecil John Rhodes, imperialist, British imperialist, the same person uh, that, you know, whose name is on the Rhodes Scholarship, the Rhodes Scholarship. And so this led to the creation of a mobilization, massive mobilization in South Africa, uh, ended up with removing the statue, but they did not end there. It led to a quite radical transformation of, I think, political discourse where the notion of decolonization became key. And so the students began to ask not only for the uh, removal of a statue, but also for the radical transformation of the university. They wanted, uh, in their words, a free decolonized education. And that is a struggle that is still continues. I'm presenting it because I've been working in South Africa for the, f for the last uh, four or five years, and I'm returning back there. So I have many ties in that community, but I want to finish going back to Puerto Rico one second. And I want to call attention to a project, a joint project that Adal Maldonado and Pedro Pietri did together which was the formation of a kind of imaginary Puerto Rican embassy. Uh, Puerto Rico is not an independent country, so we don't have any embassy. So they created a, this Puerto Rican embassy also with a passport that they call El Passport. Uh, and it's called El Espirit 
Republic de Puerto Rico. El Spirit Republic of Puerto Rico. We are a sovereign state of mind. We are well, we are well aware of the fact that it is almost 1898 again, and our own embassy is long overdue for the most interesting minds of our great multicolorful generation to congregate as heads of state and keep our aesthetic Sancocho. Uh, Sancocho is a Puerto Rican, Afro Puerto Rican, it's Puerto Rican with African roots, um, stew. Warm enough to escort our uh, eternal tropical contemporary urban lifestyle into the 21st century face of the pursuit of liberty and justice. On the dance floor of the happiness promise our existence by the multilingual Spanglish creator of man and womankind. So they replace God by uh, this multilingual Spanglish creator, for example. It is now time to take El Passport project to another zone. They, they more recently, uh, before Pedro Pietri's death, uh, began to think about the idea of admitting non-Puerto Ricans into the, this kind of uh, symbolic citizenship and of more radically questioning the idea of citizenship. Um, and these are the kinds of pictures that uh, Adam Maldonado, this is Pedro Pietri, a picture of the poet that we saw at the beginning. Now the picture is blurred intentionally um, because the, it, it, was called, it, it was part of a series called Blur, Pur, Blurred Puerto Ricans for the passport. Right? And it reads, you don't have to smile for their, their files anymore. All you have to do is look away from the camera at the new point you have written or the recent painting you found on your canvas on the morning you decided never to arrive at work on time again. And you danced all night and drank and made a toast to your favorite Indian ghost of the memory of having been in New York City before you landed in Spanish Harlem on a blimp that took forever to get from Times Square to Grand Central and back to Times Square to ask where is Times Square? A Rican lost in New York, a Rican in New York lost and so on. So these are the kind of experiences that mark citizenship in this imaginary land. It's about Spanglish, it's about being lost but also trying to find yourself in the process. I want to, to this is part of a working process and the next step of this reflection has to do with bringing to some extent, put this in dialogue with Emmanuel Levinas, uh, reflections on the ethical uh, dimensions of the face, of the human face, but particularly beyond Levinas, to put it in dialogue with uh, Gloria and Saldua's work, Making Faces, Haciendo Caras. It's about making face, making face, haciendo caras, uh, that, that, which is about uh, creative and critical writings of women of color in the US because the struggle for decolonization is, um, in part, uh, a struggle to make your face, make your soul, again, to come from below and behind to another kind of present, which is not the colonial presence, it's some other form of dimension of time that some of this art and poetry is trying to help us conceive, create, and imagine. Thank you very much. Algumas perguntas estão se sobrepondo, mas eu acho que seria algo interessante a gente começar uma pergunta para todos que estão aqui. Como as ideias apresentadas nas falas de vocês podem encontrar é, caminhos práticos para atuar num período tão complexo politicamente, socialmente, como o Brasil agora, e não somente no Brasil, mas também no mundo como um todo. Alguns caminhos práticos. Eu senti que várias perguntas estavam apontando para uma tentativa de é, colocar em prática essas ideias. Obrigada pelo questionamento. Existe uma decolonialidade em curso. É, a questão é que ela também se transforma num projeto um pouco parcial e fragmentado. É, ele não deveria necessariamente ser um projeto totalizante, claro que não, é, num espírito de alter, com uma alternativa ante o governança neoliberal com face neocolonial, é, mas um dos caminhos que eu uh, vislumbro é né, justamente essa intervenção que faz o um questionamento muito forte do eurocentrismo, e isso pode ser observado, inclusive, uh, em um nível mais micro. A própria realização desse seminário ele traz né, uma tentativa de trazer esses sujeitos apagados pela 
a história colonial eurocêntrica. A, a tradução disso em termos institucionais e a conexão entre sociedade civil e Estado uh, é bastante difícil. A gente pode dizer que talvez a Bolívia seja o único país que tenha conseguido é, constitucionalmente confrontar o colonialismo na sua carta constitucional de 2008, 2007, num contexto de refundação de Estado. Né? Então, é, trata-se também de é, aglutinar é, apoiadores desse projeto e incluir é, nesse projeto decolonial democrático, ou democrático decolonial, pessoas que não necessariamente se identifiquem é, em, uma primeira, em um primeiro momento com ele. Né? É, nesse sentido, ele precisa ser muito inclusivo e com capacidade de diálogo para quem não necessariamente entende a leitura da descolonização. Hoje, no Brasil, a gente vive disputas de narrativas que não estão partindo da mesma realidade, do mesmo diagnóstico de realidade. Uh, por exemplo, a gente consegue observar claramente um... A gente não, né? algumas pessoas, né? um avanço de um, uma espécie de... Aquilo que o Boaventura de Souza Santos chamou de fascismo social, mas nunca desenvolveu muito sistematicamente, né? um protofascismo que emerge da sociedade também e que está se institucionalizando em alguns lugares... É, burocráticos e administrativos. Né? Então, é, nem todo mundo faz essa leitura uh, de um protofascismo uh, tropical em ascensão no Brasil. E, nesse sentido, nem todo mundo faz a leitura de que é preciso se descolonizar né? o ser, o saber, o poder. Né? Inclusive, alguns acham que o colonialismo já é uma dinâmica ultrapassada. Né? Então, talvez, uma das maneiras práticas seja sempre expor sistematicamente né, essa continuidade, a resiliência do poder colonial imperial, a sua inscrição nos corpos das pessoas, nas subjetividades das pessoas, né, nos padrões de reprodução das desigualdades das pessoas. Eu trabalho na Universidade Federal de Pelotas. Pelotas foi uma cidade muito rica no século XIX, a base da escravidão, da escravização, da cultura do charque, econômica do charque. É uma história pós-colonial dessa cidade que hoje eu vivo seria uma história muito rica e de silenciamento completo da população é, negra que lá vive. Né? Então, a, a, a prática ela também vai ser descentralizada, mas ela precisa também encontrar alguns caminhos institucionais. Né? Como cientista política, ainda que heterodoxa, eu vejo que é importante algum registro institucional para se tentar modificar dinâmicas comportamentais. Né? Nelson, gostaria de falar alguma coisa sobre essa aplicabilidade prática? Sim, sim. sim. I think that part, um, we should begin um, maybe by challenging the, the, the notion of, of the practical as something completely separate from, from, from other spheres, particularly when it comes to, to the colonial uh, thinking. And I think that for uh, decolonization, it is uh, very important, it is central to think of different layers and to think of them of interconnected and operating at the same time. And a few that comes to, to mind now. I mean, I was trying to do, uh, to point in this direction with the use of a scholarship, poetry, painting, and so on um, in the presentation. Um, others would be, for example, I, I, uh, others would be thinking about uh, the need to conceive decolonization, to conceive it, to think it, and also to imagine it. And I see the labor of analysts, theoreticians, philosophers, and artists, and analysts of arts and literature, all of, all of them helping with that dimension. If we cannot conceive it or imagine it, whatever political movement we have is going to be deprived of any kind of horizon of, of really, uh, of anything new. You're going to collapse into the existing paradigm of war in coloniality. So you need that. You also need at the level of the desire to change the it's not only to conceive it and to imagine it, but 
to shift the, at, the, at the basic attitudinal level your priorities and your way of being. Right? It requires that other dimension. And the third, practice. But practice I, would, I, I want to, to, to take it not only as praxis, not only as praxis, uh, some kind of movement and action, but also as practicing, as practicing, as when you have to practice something many times. Right? And the idea is that I think that even though, as Fanon puts it, the explosion may not happen today, it is too soon or too late, we still need to continue practice, practicing. Practicing what? Practicing this imagination, practicing uh, this conceptualization, but practicing coming together as collectives with different initiatives to put our imagination, our desire, and conceptualization, and strategies of action together. That's the practicing we need. That can inform, could become in a context a political party, that could become a social movement, that could, you know, it could enter the public space in multiple ways. What is fundamental, I think, is that we keep practicing, bringing all these elements without subordinating one to the other. And out of there, I think the action will continue. We can think, for example, what would it be to do art and decolonization in this practical way? Practical way as in practicing, again, all of this is praxis and practice. So what would it be doing it, engaging in a, in a practice, right? And probably later we will know even more about the exhibition and so on. What are the elements of a decolonial practice at the artistic level that will defy the disconnection between that and the political and so on? In a context like Brazil, with the political situation now and the US, this is a no small matter. No small matter. And it will, uh, it cannot escape becoming controversial. So, what is that practicing? Um, I think that that's the question that we put to think about the political and the practical in that way. Orlando, did you have a Gracias. Um, well, I, I, when the question came to mind, I was thinking about uh, also what Nelson mentioned in his presentation, the movements to decolonize the university. In the Netherlands, we've had a very strong uh, movement as well and we produced a report with Professor Gloria Becker in which we, um, we suggested very practical recommendations to decolonize the university. You can look at it, it's, it's free for download on the web. And it meant not just changing who has access to the university, but it meant a positioning the university in its modern colonial history, transforming pedagogical practices, transforming ways of teaching training. So what is happening in the classroom? Is the classroom reproducing uh, modernity coloniality? Is it reproducing the colonial difference? Who are we reading? Who is part of the canon of knowledge? So there are very, very practical elements that can change now about how a university is done. And the same for the museum, where we have been engaged with uh, many debates on decolonizing the museum how to change curatorial practices, how to make the museum conscious of its insertion in modern colonial history, how both museum and university are implicated in reproducing the colonial difference, in the production of whiteness as a norm, for example. So all, all these things are leading to very practical recommendations on how to change the way this key institutions of the epistemic power of modernity are being managed today and making them responsible for having produced and reproduced the colonial difference. Certo. Uma pergunta específica para Luciana, mas caso vocês queiram responder também, sinto se à vontade. É uma dúvida que na verdade é mais uma pergunta sobre os termos descolonização, pós-colonial e decolonização. Eu sinto que seria uma coisa para deixar um pouquinho mais clara para o público é, as especificidades de cada termo, os usos de cada termo. Bom, é, obrigada pela pergunta. É, obviamente, é uma tentativa de organização é, da teoria antipós decolonial que eu tento fazer é uma tentativa particular minha uh, tratar, tentar também uh, digamos uh, alocar em diferentes contextos 
uh, as diferentes preocupações e autores, digamos assim, em relação à temática do colonialismo e da descolonização. Eu gosto de pensar três fases é, para o pensamento, a intervenção, a teoria... Uh, anti-pós-decolonial. Uma primeira fase, é nos anos 50, 60, que a gente poderia chamar de um pós-colonialismo anticolonial, num contexto muito imbuído das lutas de descolonização e libertação, é, do terceiro mundo, né? em um contexto, inclusive, no qual a América Latina ainda não participava, digamos assim, de um projeto maior de emancipação via libertação nacional. Né? Se a gente vai fazer essa perspectiva histórica, a gente percebe que nos anos 50, 60, é justamente o momento que os nossos estados latino-americanos começam a ensaiar as dinâmicas daquilo que o Guilherme O'Donnell chamou de estados burocráticos autoritários. Né? Portanto, as questões que se colocavam na América Latina eram outras questões. Né? Um pós-colonialismo mais canônico, digamos assim, e que o projeto decolonial tenta se diferenciar, é aquele muito mais influenciado pelo pós-estruturalismo, pós-fundacionalismo, os subaltern studies, né? Aquelas, uh, aqueles expoentes mais é, canônicos, Eduardo Said, é, Gayatri Spivak, alguma linha, é, os próprios estudos é, afro, uh, estudos culturais, né? de um num certo sentido, estou pensando uh, em autores não especific especificamente pós-coloniais, né? como Paul, Paul de Roy ou que tem aí uma outra confluência, um, Stuart Hall, uh, e depois uh, essa tentativa de fazer uma releitura da agenda anti e pós-colonial via América Latina, a partir dos anos 90, né, e a partir dos estudos subalternos latino-americanos, eu entendo como a inserção... Uh, da América Latina no, no debate global sobre pós-colonialismo. Né? Se, se nós formos pensarmos em termos exclusivamente temporais, né? a América Latina, o seu momento pós-colonial é no século XIX. Né? Então, tem aí um, um desafio muito interessante para se pensar a história da América Latina e do Brasil, em particular, dentro dessa grande é, construção que o, que o Nelson Maldonado Torres chamou aqui de, é, de, da catástrofe da colonialidade. Né? São diferentes formas de inserção. Então, eu entendo essa ideia, esse pós-colonialismo decolonial, digamos assim, uma inflexão mais latino-americana para o debate global sobre o pós-colonialismo. Né? Mas isso eu, eu tenho também um trabalho escrito, bastante didático, né, com alguns autores, algumas temáticas referentes a cada um desses períodos. Uh, ele chama é, Modernidade e Colonialidade sem Imperialidade, o elo perdido do giro colonial. Então, ele está acessível também, saiu na Dados, a revista de ciências sociais do IESP. Né, ele conta um pouquinho essas diferenciações. E só também uma observação, nem todos os autores pós-coloniais canônicos, por exemplo, se engajaram numa dinâmica de num projeto normativo político, estético, artístico, de descolonização. Né? Então, a, a entrada da América Latina no debate global do pós-colonialismo no século XXI, ela reatualiza e ressignifica a descolonização como justiça. Né? Então, quando a gente percebe isso, por exemplo, no novo constitucionalismo latino-americano, é, isso fica bastante evidente, inclusive, nesses termos práticos institucionais e constitucionais. Né? Lembrando que, por exemplo, a Bolívia tem um vice-ministério um ministério de descolonização, um vice-ministério de despatriarcalização. Né? Então, uh, uh, o Nelson Maldonado Torres falou aqui sobre o feminismo decolonial e o feminismo pós-colonial, que é um outro debate né, que surge nos anos 80 e depois agora mais recentemente. Então, tem aí diferentes formas de contar essa genealogia, é, eu tenho uma, isso é um pouco um vício disciplinar de tentar categorizar, disciplinar, mas eu sei que os estudos pós-coloniais e decoloniais não combinam com isso. Peço desculpa por esse meu ranço positivista. Ronaldo, gostaria de falar alguma observação sobre termos? 
Just a footnote, an additional uh, um, footnote about uh, the terminology. In a way, po the post-colonial post has referred mainly, and actually or it originated the, the notion of post-coloniality in relation to the second wave of, of uh, decolonization that happened in the 20th century, primarily around African, Middle Eastern, Asian countries that obtained independence. So in the, in the uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, there was this notion, well, they were colonies, now they are independent, now they are post-colonial. So it was very, in a way, simple kind of designation. Later on, it was taken as the label for a form of theorizing that was thinking about the conditions of those that were no longer formally colonial, but were grappling with the legacies of colonization. Decolonial, I think, means different thing, and it has come from different directions. I think not uh, Latin America being part of them, but not only. And in a way, if you look at uh, Quijano, I think the main influences were not simply the work of the uh, sociologists of dependency, but more particularly, I think it plays a big role, the indigenous mobilizations around the 500th anniversary of the discovery of the Americas. They took a very important role bringing up the question about the relevance. What is the thing that we're going to celebrate in 1992? And in that context also, it was coincide, coinciding with a climax of uh, some kind of a skepticism towards traditional Marxism. Because the, the, you know, the, the part of the, the Cold War era was coming to a formal end. It still continues in, in South Korea and so on, but it was coming to a formal end. And there was this enchantment about the possibilities of Marxism. Some people kept Marxism, but they knew like Quijano, but they knew that they had to rethink fundamental basis, and they did it in a way by also taking seriously the questions that indigenous peoples were raising. And that is when in 1991, 1992, the notion of decolonization becomes prominent again. It's no longer simply about socialization, right? socialism and so on, it's about this thing called decolonization of thought. At the same time, women of color in the United States were also pushing in similar directions, and indigenous peoples throughout the world has been, have been also bringing out this. They, they became very vocal and gained light, their, their, you know, and their, their complaints and their questions gained visibility in the context of the 500-year anniversary, because all the nation states were preparing to celebrate in the Americas. But it's not that it is then that they began to question what is colonialism, that they saw that there was something very important to, uh, about the so-called discovery and conquest to the formation of modernity. So part of the roots are there. And of course, and of course part of the root is in uh, black intellectuals, and this goes centuries, to think about the Haitian Revolution. Haitian Revolution, the first so-called Latin American Caribbean Republic that got independent uh, it was a black nation, and they aspired to eradicate anti-black racism in the planet. Uh, there were many contradictions, but they had what could be called today partly a decolonial agenda. So I think we need to go back there and to these different populations to understand. So it's different then from the reference to the post-colonial. Even though within post-colonial theory, one can also find some efforts, some contributions to think about this. Obrigado. Just to complement what you have been saying, I think it's maybe just to clarify because of the sense of the question, the, uh, the distinctions between the post-colonial and the decolonial as we see it. And obviously the post-colonial as it came to the academy, it came through the figures that you mentioned like Spivak and Said, and it uh, it belonged, it's, it's cultural archive or it's the archive from which it is reflecting and writing has a lot to do with the British and French empires. So what Dussel will call the second modernity, whereas the decolonial is reflecting from the moment of 1492 that we will see following also Dussel as the beginning of modernity, the beginning of the Western project of civilization. So we are working with a completely different archive, even though the efforts are similar in many ways, but we work from a different archive in which, as Nelson was saying, the women of color thinking, particularly Chicana and black feminisms, uh, the theology of liberation, indigenous mob mobilizations as thought, as people creating theory, 
and ways of thinking about the world, Caribbean thought coming from the Haitian Revolution, all that is coming to inform the decolonial. And all these roots do not uh, appear, well, there are some uh, coincidences through the Caribbean, but in the post-colonial. And also what is very important to clarify just didactically is that coloniality is not the same as colonialism. So colonialism will finish with independence, with a political project towards the state and citizenship and liberation. And coloniality has not ended, right? Coloniality is part of the project of modernity. It's part of contemporary art. Contemporary art has its coloniality, its forms of erasure, of silencing. So decolonization is not decoloniality. Decolonization was a movement to liberate the state uh, as a political historical movement, but decoloniality is ongoing. It, it is touching on aesthetics, on epistemologies, also on territories, on social movements. So it, we, we do not need to confuse um, the two. Uh, well, I think that's what is important for the moment. So in, in this way, some final thought is that the, the canon of the post-colonial, most of them will see the horizon of post-coloniality to achieve an entrance into modernity. So it is, we are also part of modernity, a strategy. You, modernity is not just European. We are also part of modernity in our colonial histories. The decolonial strategy for some of us is not that. The decolonial strategy is to delink from modernity. We don't want to become modern because for us modernity implies coloniality. Right? We want to be able to become something else, to go beyond resistance. And that is the horizon of decoloniality that is very different from the horizon of decolonization that is an entrance into modernity. Thank you. Just, just a very um, a, a small note um, into what Rolando said, and this because I, I brought up Puerto Rico, and in Puerto Rico, colonialism has not ended. And for many indigenous peoples over the planet, colonialism has not ended. What you call the independent state is still a colonial state. So we can, coloniality and colonialism continue alongside. And in the same way, decolonization also continues to be relevant, both in the traditional way, but also for many peoples, like indigenous peoples in the Caribbean and so on, that have been dealing with the long durée of colonialism, when they talk about colonialism, it was never purely about the formal juridical relationship. It was also about other areas. So in a way, people have been also talking about decoloniality with the concept of decolonization for a long time, and I think that they will continue doing so. So I think that these concepts, it's important to make the differentiation, certainly. But uh, I, I would say that they're something that are not as distinct, as separate as, as uh, one may think. Queria até uh, conversar e perguntar se o que, que vocês acham sobre isso. É que aqui no Brasil, um, essa, os estudos uh, pós-coloniais e decoloniais, eles uh, muito recentemente começaram a ser trabalhados, teoricamente também. Então, uh, eu tenho também muito contato, muita demanda com diferentes uh, alunos de graduação, de pós-graduação, uh, de áreas, por exemplo, relações internacionais. Então, uh, uma agenda de pesquisa teórica que se coloca sobre uh, descolonização e relações internacionais, no sentido de questionar o eurocentrismo do sistema internacional, a violência, a, a escravidão que estrutura o sistema internacional de estados e que sempre é omitido pelo cânone uh, liberal e realista. Mas, por exemplo, uh, algumas leituras mais apressadas banalizam alguns conceitos, e eu não gosto de ser chamada de preciosista conceitual, mas tem três conceitos que me incomodam bastante, e aí, inclusive, eu gostaria de compartilhar isso. Um é a ideia de pós-colonialidade. Porque, uh, se, se nós formos entender a colonialidade como a lógica do colonialismo em operação, a pós-colonialidade ela, ela perde o seu valor é, heurístico. Ou, ou, né? Então, assim, falar em pós-colonialismo, e aí toda a discussão que, que se traz, me parece mais é, correto do que pós-colonialidade, porque a colonialidade ela não pode ter um pós, ela não pode ter um, esse, esse prefixo 
ela é colonialidade. É, pelo menos eu entendo assim. Uma outra expressão que me incomoda bastante é a pós-colonialista, porque se nós formos pegar é, ai, o Albert Memmi, é, o, o colonialista é um sujeito diferente do colono, do colonizador. Então, também, quando falamos em pós-colonialista, estamos é, utilizando um prefixo para um, para um tipo de sujeito. Então, me parece também uma, uma expressão equivocada. E a que mais, então, me incomoda, que é, tem a ver com uma certa, um afã, uma necessidade de nós construirmos uma outra teoria de médio e longo alcance, é a expressão decolonialismo, ou seja... A tradução dessa ideia de decolonialidade, que é uma noção de resistência, de contraface, para já uma estrutura filosófica, teórica, né, que é, desemboca em um outro ismo. Então, eu também costumo dizer aos meus alunos que decolonialismo uh, do not, não, exi, não existe. Então, não, não sei se vocês também compartilham alguma visão parecida ou diferente em relação a esses... Três específicos termos. Well, more generally, I think in our position, we we move away from the prefix post, right? Because of its implications in many, um, well, its temporality, but also its archive from which it comes, which I said it is from this um, archive of the French and. British imperialisms generally, and, and U.S. imperialism as well. So, so I, I would agree that in, in our perspective, the post is not meaning the D. The decolonial carries the D-link, carries the possibility of forming an alternative horizon of existence, alternative political governance, alternative forms of subjectivity, of aesthetics. But, I mean, the other thing that is important is, uh, going back to the comment of Nelson, is that we are always very respectful of contextual histories. So if people in Puerto Rico use uh, uh, post-coloniality or, uh, or some First Nations in Mexico never use decoloniality, that's not a problem for us, right? I, I think it's not about the terminology, but it's about the movement. What is the movement of uh, delinking from the matrix of modernity, right? This is, and it can be called very differently in many different contexts, right? So in that sense, we say the decolonial is an option, right? As Sulma Palermo suggested, not because it's the history of coloniality is not real, but because it is not imposing itself as an ism, as an ideology, where everybody has to use the vocabulary of the decolonial, right? You could be doing a decolonial move with a completely different vocabulary, right? Particularly in Mexico, many of the First Nations movements don't use the terms decolonial, right? But they are, in our view, engaging in very strong innovations of decolonial formations, right? Of disengagement from the state, etc. So this is, uh, for me, what is special is to disengage from the debates from the academy about what are the precise terms to speak about and to begin looking at the movement, the historical movements that are implicated, even if the terms might be contradictory in, for philosophy, right? What is happening with those terms? What is the movement towards history they are, they are doing? So that is, for me, the key, and, and in that sense, in our perspective for our epistemic struggle that we do vis-a-vis -vis the theory of contemporary art or, or Western criticism or critical tradition, we use the decolonial as a way of emphasizing the linking, emphasizing we are looking from the outside of modernity. Right? Yes, I, I very much agree also with that. Perhaps I would say that the coloniality is an imperative that can be said, can be described, can be fought for with multiple languages and multiple terms. Right? Um, now, many of these terms have already existed and they have been part of struggles. These are not simply you know, uh, the result of some academics wanting to engage what they see as a new wave of scholarship and wanting to claim a space 
by either using or rejecting or mildly modificating categories. That's more, I see it as an, a part of uh, what Lewis Gordon has called epistemic and disciplinary decadence. So uh, instead of actually, you know, it's like uh, um, the Quan said that, that when you, you know, if you're pointing to the moon, like don't get distracted looking at the finger. You are, look, it's the moon that you are pointing to, right? And, uh, and in many scholarly spaces, a lot has to do, you know, it's the, it's the finger. What term, as soon as you see that there is one finger that is getting visualized in some way, that is getting attention, then you engage the finger. You're forgetting in many cases that it's not about the finger, it's about a process of struggle. So I think that definitely the accent is in these struggles. And it's not only about, you know, it's not only about paying attention, not paying attention to the hand pointing to the moon. It's not, it's not about that. And it's not only about paying attention to the moon either. Because the very modality of paying attention has colonial traces. When you have people fighting and struggling, putting their lives, their blood on the line, when people cannot breathe, where you are underwater, you don't need people now to look at the moon, to look at the water and you on the water. Like the challenge is for you to become an agent, to, to find a way to exert agency, to become an agent with others and engage in a form of creative, critical, constructive, transformational experience. That is the practicing that I was talking about. So when I see all these modalities in the academy, whether, you know, and they tend to be either, I have seen so many people that have been working on something else, and then suddenly they read a few essays on post decoloniality, and they change the term, and now they use, is the colonial everything, and even the book, and they just cite two people that write about decoloniality, and now this is supposedly a decolonial project. Of course, that is not substantially it. And then other people that said, no, that's something else. We are about something else completely. And they reclaim Marxism. They reclaim something else that they think is, is on the other side, and that's what they do. And then there are others that, again, are sort of closed, and they, they want to take on the details. No, it's not decoloniality. It's, and then you introduce some little modification as if, for me, these are, this is all part of epistemic disciplinary decadence. Only if you are in the struggle, debating, connecting, participating, right? Then I think you have the earned the right to speak and no longer as an academic, but as an actually aspiring the colonial agent with others. And before you speak, you have to listen quite a lot, which points to the importance of listening. Let, let me just uh, <laughs> compliment very briefly, because this is something very important that is happening today in many places where we go, and is that the decolonial is becoming a fashion, right? And when it becomes a fashion, it's becoming an adjective for all sorts of things. Just replacing any other term. Like, I'm going to deconstruct, I mean decolonize, right? I've heard people saying these type of things. So what is, I try to clarify in my talk is that not every critique is decolonial, right? Not every critique is decolonial. Critique is very good. Foucault is very good. But it's not decolonial. It's not carrying the question of coloniality and the question of the colonial difference. So I think there is today a task of not losing the clarity that this is about the struggle and not about just replacing the old terms by decoloniality everywhere. Bom, nosso tempo está acabando, mas eu gostaria de trazer mais uma última pergunta do público para o Nelson. A pergunta é o seguinte: é possível fazer uma leitura decolonial da arte europeia como a exibida aqui no MASP, na coleção do museu? Uma leitura, leitura decolonial, decolonial de... da, cole... da arte europeia e, ou, como, da... ou da coleção do MASP, que é uma coleção com bastante arte europeia também. Mm. Mm. Uh, good question, great question. Um, well, you see that what I tried to do in my presentation, that I linked, you know, I show uh, uh, samples of, let's say, you know, non-hegemonic, non-European, you know, poetry, uh, um, art, but then I also, you know, the Kemel Mayer painting that is for me so fundamental, and even the, you know, Michelangelo painting is part of this, this exhibition. If the exhibition in my PowerPoint is part of the museum exhibition now, then hopefully this is a sample of a way in which you can incorporate some elements of European art in a kind of, but you put it in conversation and with a framing 
that is not simply about celebrating the glory of humanitas, of this European subject, of this, or investing in the uh, hegemonic forms or conceptions of the aesthetic or of the beautiful, or even of the beautiful and the political. You put it in another kind of environment. But even if you're serious about the decolonial, you go beyond that, right? You have to open up the museum in, in, in other multiple ways. That have been done in, in, you know, in many other places and probably have been done here before. You know, what would it mean then to think about decolonial art and even to, to open European art um, for communities that have not been the beneficiaries of Europeanity directly, right? So imagine, I mean, think. Imagine what would it be, invite indigenous authors to recreate those paintings and to challenge, you know, challenge them. What would it be to invite some European painters to go to live in indigenous communities, to, re to paint some other work, to have exchanges, support indigenous communities. Um, the possibilities are endless uh, in that way. Of course, you have to break with the idea that this is what you do, right? This, this, this art is the only thing that you do. Uh, but you can own you know, that, that art and you can do very creative things with that. You can bring that, whatever collection you have, to, the, to this kind of larger project and lend your space for these larger efforts. And so I think that there is a space to do that. And, in the, you know, and then you bring temporary, ten, temporary exhibitions that you put in dialogue with the permanent ones and then you begin to acquire other work and then gradually the museum itself can begin to change not only the contents, but maybe even the structure. There will be other spaces that are like workshops where people will interact in a different way, right? So the sky is the, is the limit. Uh, and I think we need to see these spaces as spaces of possibilities. But we have to, uh, we have to assume the challenge, the real substantive challenge of what that is, because simply, Changing the exhibition, doing one activity or the other won't be, won't cut it, won't be enough for the coloniality. But that doesn't mean that we need necessarily to, to burn all the European art. <coughs> Even though in Cape Town, the students ended up burning quite a bit of art from a library. And there was a lot of, you know, backlash immediately from, from, from the, you know, the, the leaders of the university and parts of the elite until I remember one of the artists that said, well, one of those paintings was mine, and I would say that that was not the best way, the best place for the painting. I am fine with the painting having been burnt. And so why would it be, you know, being in a museum where you can even think, have that kind of relationship with these works of art? So that's what I mean by accepting this challenge really really seriously. It goes beyond one conference, of course, everything, but this is part of, it could be part of a project. Obrigado, eu gostaria de agradecer a Luciana, Nelson e Rolando pelas suas falas, agradecer a todos pela participação e voltamos às 14 horas. Obrigado.